Here at Precision Matthews, we ship lathes to all kinds of customers. Prototype shops, model makers, gunsmiths, and plenty of hobbyists in their home shops working on their passion projects. One question that just about everyone asks, regardless of their use case, is how does the lathe arrive at my door? The answer is, it looks like this. Any small accessories you order are packed in the crate. If you order the stand, that's on top, and it all goes through the wrapping machine until it looks like the leftovers your mom made you take home from dinner at her house. Just know that this package is not microwave safe. The next question is often, how do I get it set up from there? Well, that answer is a little more in depth, and that's what we're gonna cover in this video. Let's get started. Let's get into this crate. I know a crowbar would make you feel like Gordon Freeman at Black Mesa, but all you need in this case is a 7 16 driver on a drill or impact. Note that the label is going to be placed on the headstock side of the crate, so you can use that to orient the pallet before you even pull the top off the crate and see the lathe. I got my arch enemy Tony here to help me take the top off the crate, but you probably want to use a friend instead. The lathe is secured to the pallet with 14 mm hex head lag screws, so don't forget to remove those before you lift the lathe. So how do we lift the lathe? If you have access to a forklift, that's by far the easiest method and the one we're showing first. Whatever lifting method you use, you're probably going to use two equal length straps with some pieces of wood that spread the lifting straps so that they don't put any pressure on the lead screw on the front of the ways or the DRO scale on the back of the ways if one is installed. The pieces of wood need to be long enough that they clear the front of the lead screw and the back of the DRO scale by at least an inch on each side. So measure the total width of everything, add two inches, and cut a few pieces of wood for the straps to lay on under the bed. Then cut two more pieces exactly the same size to spread the straps up top. We're about to talk about using an engine hoist, and I'll admit that we kind of cheated by filming the forklift first. That's because if you're using an engine hoist, you will have to have an extra step to initially get the lathe off the pallet. Because the legs of most engine hoists are not wide enough to clear the sides of the pallet, you have to get the sawzall and make some room. Should I say reciprocating saw instead? I guess sawzall is a registered trademark of the Milwaukee Tool Corporation, isn't it? Well, if they're sad about a little proprietary eponym, they can cry into their Kleenex, or they can cry into their non-branded facial tissue. Anyway, cut the crate along these lines so the engine hoist legs can fit. Where the forklift has four points of contact between the straps and the forks, there's only one point of contact between the engine hoist and the straps. That means you'll need to be more exact with your strap placement than if you were using a forklift. Not only do you have to find a good spot left and right to lift the headstock and tailstock evenly, you'll also have to play around with the placement of the straps forward and backward to lift the lathe without an alligator rolling, tipping forward or backward. There's also an extra piece of wood needed in this case between the two pieces of wood on the bottom to keep the straps spread apart. Also note that we have different layers of wood under each strap. We need an extra layer of wood under the tailstock side since the straps are the same length, but the casting's higher on that side. You'll just have to experiment to get things to lift stable and level. And I can't state this enough, there are many different ways to do this, and everyone will do it a little differently. This is just one way that we came up with. The wood needs to be thin enough that you can fit it between the casting and the pallet, but thick enough that it can take the weight without snapping, another place where experimentation is needed. Eric is the guy here who builds most of our crates, and we bothered him three separate times before we found something on his scrap pile that we liked. So if you're using an engine hoist, you'll probably raise the lathe three inches, set it back down, adjust the straps, and try again about a dozen times. That's fine. It's better to get it right at that point than to risk dropping the lathe. If you call me to order replacement hand wheels because you dropped your lathe on its face, you have to start the call by saying, sorry, Charlie, I didn't listen to you when you said to take your time with the strap placement. I'll forgive you, but I'd rather save you the call in the first place. So go slow, take your time, and you'll be fine. There you have it. Moving machine tools can be stressful, and that's why rigging companies charge good money to do the job. But if you follow the guidelines and best practices we've covered, you'll now have your lathe in place and on the stand in one piece. It's not quite ready to make chips yet. Cleaning, leveling, and dialing in the lathe is the next video. So don't forget to click the bell to turn on the notifications so that you don't miss out on that. 
As always, thanks for watching.